CIY, it's been an incredible week for me. You have given me so much more than I've been able to give you. But I want you to, as you're walking back to your seats, do me a favor. Let's join together and um, honor all the people that have been putting in so much work leading up to this, leading behind the scenes, running the cameras, running the audio. Let's give them a round of applause. Also, I want to uh, let you know, as I go back home in a few hours, um, what I'm going back home to. I have a beautiful family that is waiting for me at home. My wife of 20 years, her name is Erin. We have uh, three beautiful children, Evan, who's 10, Lily, who's 7, and Sadie, who's 3. And I just cannot wait to see them. They make it possible for me to be here. And I'm so grateful for the blessing of God in my life. I just, I wanted to show them off. Is that okay to introduce them to you? Now, I want you to pull out your Bibles or your devices if you still have them. And we're going to finish Psalm 23 with verse 6. It's also going to be on the screen. We're going to spend the rest of our uh, time together on that verse uh, for the next few minutes. We're going to uh, make a few observations and then uh, we will be able to uh, go on with the rest of our day. Now, as you go there, once again, thank you for the opportunity that you've given me to serve with you and to serve you. It's been an incredible blessing for me. Uh, Psalm 23, verse 6. The psalmist says, Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. If you're taking notes, the title of this teaching is At His Pace. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your word. Use it to challenge us, to encourage us, to lead us. And Father, may it be embedded in our hearts. May nobody leave here unchanged, but may we be transformed because your Holy Spirit is present and leading us and speaking to us. And we pray these things in your holy and powerful name, Jesus. Amen. Now, finishing a race is all about running at the right pace. Believe it or not, at one point I ran a half marathon and I finished it. There were 15,000 people. I was somewhere around number 14,000. Pregnant women finished before me. People in their 80s and 90s finished before me. There were so many people that finished before me and I had such a hard time. I got cramps. Along the way, I had to uh, stop and ask for help. I ended up almost walking that last mile. And part of the reason is because I tried to outsmart the race. Even though I had trained well for about six months, I thought to myself, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to gas it up on the first couple of miles. I'm going to run as fast as I can and I'm going to take a lot of caffeine. And so at five in the morning, I, I drank all the coffee that I could and all the caffeine that I could in energy drink. And of course, my body didn't take it so well. At around mile one and a half, I started to feel this rumbling within me uh, that, was, that was giving a, an effect in my body similar to the effect that you see when you mix Coca-Cola with Mentos. If you don't know what I'm talking about, look it up. Because there was a fizzy explosion that held me back for longer than I cared. Now, my wife was also running the same race. But she kept up at a good pace. The rhythm that our coach had given us was to run for five minutes and walk for one. And she did exactly that and was able to finish the race way ahead of me because she had a really good pace. Now, what I experienced is the fact that if you want to finish a race, you have to have a good pace. In some cases, having a good pace can be a matter of life or death. Uh, early in the 1900s, uh, there was a race to the South Pole and there were a few expeditions that went there to try and reach uh, that center of Antarctica. Um, but nobody could do it. And at some point, there were a couple of teams that began preparing for it. One was from Norway. The other one was from Great Britain. Now, the team from Norway prepared really well. They analyzed the path really well. And they came up with a good plan to get to the South Pole. The team from Great Britain also had plans. But they trusted in what they thought was their strength more than on their pace. 
And so as they both started more or less at around the same time, the British team struggled. And the reason they struggled is because their leader would make them go as long and as hard as they could when the weather was good. And when the weather was not good, they would stop. And so every 30 or 40 or 50 miles, they would go so hard for so long that they would be exhausted and they started to be depleted of energy really fast. Now the Norwegian team, by contrast, they had a, a really good strategy. The strategy was to travel a consistent 20 miles each day regardless of the weather. And they stayed pretty close to that plan, so much so that they were the first ones to get to the South Pole. When the British team got to this place that you're seeing in the picture, they were disappointed, they were hungry, they were exhausted, and they started their trip back. And little by little, they started to suffer from the exhaustion. And unfortunately, all of them passed away on their way back because they didn't keep up with the good pace. As we follow Jesus with the rest of our lives, we have to know that we have to have a good pace so that we can finish the race well. And here's a big idea that we, can, that we can sit on for the next few minutes is the pace that Jesus calls us to is slow and consistent. The pace that Jesus calls us to is slow and consistent. This is what he's showing us in Psalm 23 verse 6 because he's using a particular word that is, that is not giving us the idea of rushing to be in his presence. But giving us the idea that we can be with him in a different way. In that second part of verse 6 of uh, Psalm 23 he says, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Here's what we can observe from that portion is that at his space to dwell is the opposite of hurry. To dwell is the opposite of hurry. Dwelling means living in, inhabiting in a place. And uh, in antiquity, uh, even though people would be outside um, working all day long, usually their day ended when the sun went, w would go down and they would spend a lot more time than we do today in their homes. You see, today we more or less treat our homes like a hotel. We may get there as late as we can so that we can take advantage of every hour of light and sometimes even darkness. But back then their home was not like a hotel but more a place of community, a place where they could dwell together, find rest, find relationships, find refreshment. And this is the idea that Jesus is using to let us know that we need to understand how to dwell with him. And in order to do that, we have to keep a pace that is slow and consistent. Uh, in in um, Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 30, in the message translation, it conveys this idea in a beautiful way. Let me read it to you. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. I love the way this translation shows us that Jesus is even calling us out because we can get exhausted in the rhythm of life that we have. And he's saying, are you tired? And so I want to ask you this question today, not because of we, we've spent a, a great week at camp playing games and staying up at night, but because life has been uh, so busy as we try to finish high school or as we try to uh, graduate to the next uh, season or as we try to figure out what life looks like. Are you tired? Are you worn out yet? And I'm posing this question, but it really is Jesus in this, in this text even asking us, are you burnt out on religion? Has, has religion been one of the reasons why you have been so tired and exhausted because you're trying to check all the Christian uh, boxes so that you can show yourself to be a good and faithful believer when in reality you've been doing all the things but not really being in his presence? And I love how he says, learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Instead, we are living in forced rhythms of hustle. And some of us love to wake up every day and take a hustle pill so that we can go on with our days and accomplish as much as we want. And it is part of the Western culture 
to be a culture of doing, not of being. And Jesus is speaking to a culture of being, and he's letting us know that we can also be with him. But for those of us who are living in a culture of hustle, and we're taking hustle pills uh, every morning to get through the day, we need to understand that there are consequences to these pills. There are consequences to this lifestyle. And just like you, you see the side effects of a medicine in a commercial, I want to read to you some of the side effects of living a life of hustle, of living a stressful life that is replete with forced rhythms of busy. These are some of the side effects of, tr of, of stress and hustling on and on. Increased risk of cardiovascular disease, weakened immune system, digestive issues, stomach ulcers, irritable bowel syndrome, muscle tension and pain, anxiety disorders, generalized anxiety, panic attack, depression and mood swings, difficulty concentrating and making decisions, insomnia or other sleep disturbances, rooting for the New England Patriots, increased irritability and frustration, changes in appetite, you start eating fried chicken with ketchup and not with honey, substance abuse, withdrawal from social activities, impair, impaired memory and cognitive function, racing thoughts and constant worrying, difficulty in problem solving and learning new information, enjoying salads and soups, um, strained relationships with family, friends and co-workers, decreased empathy and patience, and an obsession with, an obsession with Taylor Swift. I will confess, my wife drug me to a Taylor Swift concert once. I was the only dude in that whole arena, but she does put on a good show. She's a pretty good musician, but it could be one of the side effects. This is just a way of showing you that there are consequences to living a life that is hurrying and stressful and so busy that you run over people. And at some point in the 19th and 20th century, the rat race began to creep into the life of the church. And for years, a lot of us have been taught that just as much as the world hustles and works in a stressful manner, that in such way we need to be serving Jesus. And that is such a prideful attitude. Because it basically is, is taking on the role of the Messiah. It's called a messianic complex where we think we can become the savior of others by our behavior, by our activities, by the things that we do. But this is a prideful attitude because we're not the ones that bring transformation. He's the one that brings transformation. Amen. We're not the ones that can give grace. He's the one that can give grace. You guys, I could die today and there could, the Lord could use somebody else to be the morning teacher tomorrow. And this is why there are many of us throughout the nation this summer doing the same thing is because God can use anyone to accomplish anything. He doesn't need me. I get to serve him and it is an honor to serve him. But I don't have to take on the role of Messiah. The only positions available in the kingdom are positions of servants. The position of Messiah has already been given to him. Philippians uh, chapter 1 verse 6 says, Be confident in this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. This means that the Lord is the one that is going to complete his ministry, he's the one that's going to complete what he's doing in you today. And some of you are maybe experiencing anxiety as we're getting close to the, uh, to the end of this uh, amazing week. Because you're thinking, what happens when I go back and I begin to experience the temptation and the triggers and the relationships that are toxic in my life that bring me down. How can I finish the work that God has started? You can't finish it, but he can. And once you leave this place in a few hours or tomorrow, you need to know that he is the one that's going to finish a work in you. And we can be faithful with a slow and consistent pace of a relationship with Jesus. I, I had personally, I had a, almost a breakdown uh, in the year 2019 because I had been overworking for many, many years. I had been doing so much uh, ministry and, and, and barely ever saying no to anything that wasn't uh, the, the activity of serving Jesus. And as uh, some preacher put it once, I was more in love with the vineyard than with the Lord of the vineyard. And I was doing the work at the vineyard, but it was burning me out. And at some point, after a series of events, 
that I won't bore you with right now, I ended up uh, almost collapsing and beginning a season of having to seek healing. And one of the things that the Lord led me to understand is that uh, as I seek what my purpose is in a way that is slow and consistent, at a better pace I can see the Lord accomplishing more around me and through me. And I'm now in a season where I'm still learning this. It comes back, it, it haunts me so much because I am an Enneagram 3. I like to get things done. I'm an achiever. I, I, I like to figure out a project and see it all the way through. Whenever that project is done, I have to have another one and another one and another one. The Lord is still working in my life. But in this season, I'm forcing myself to slow down. Sometimes I'm not really good at it. A, a few weeks ago, as I was preparing this particular teaching for this verse... I was having a moment of panic because of all the work that I had been doing and I couldn't really find time to sit down and study. And so I decided to take a day off from my work at a church and to go to my backyard and lay in my hammock and uh, just study the word and let him talk to me. And one of the things that Psalm 23 says is he leads me beside peaceful streams. And it just so happens that our, our home in the north side of Indianapolis, it's right by a creek. And from the hammock, I could hear the creek. And I started smiling, thinking, Jesus, you are literally doing this for me so that I can slow down and let you speak into my life. Please don't make the mistake of going back into a life of hustle. Don't make the mistake of going back into a pace that could take your life. Back in uh, verse 6 of Psalm 23, he says at the beginning of that uh, verse, Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. I love that he's saying, uh, the, the author is explaining to us that there is something that comes from God that is following him, that is pursuing him. That his love is actually after him and in the same way his love and his compassion are pursuing us. And that's another observation we can make from this text is that at his pace, his love catches up with us. When we're walking at his pace, his love finds us. And in fact, it even finds us when we're walking faster than the pace he wants us to walk in in life because of his grace. Now, some of you are probably already looking for love. But you may be looking for love in the wrong places or with the wrong people. What if I told you that the greatest love that exists is the kind of love that is already after you, that is already pursuing you, that is already wanting you, all of you, the way that you are right now and that thinks the world of you. And that is the type of love that is chasing after us. Now remember this psalm that we've been reading this whole week is about a sheep following their shepherd. And we are reminded of something that, that shepherds have to do as they chase stray sheep is that sheep tend to run away. Because we are vulnerable. We are clumsy. We are prideful. And when he's using this, uh, this whole idea to show us that he's pursuing us, he is reminding us that he's doing that in the same way that a shepherd goes after his sheep. I've never lost a sheep but for a few minutes one time I lost my son. My wife and I were at our house. We were on a Saturday just doing chores and cleaning. And all of a sudden uh, our, our little boy in diapers uh, ran out of the room. And we couldn't hear him anymore. And we were just trusting that he was around. And then I started looking for him and I couldn't find him. And panic started to rise because I didn't know where he was. So little by little I start calling his name, Evan, Evan, where are you? I looked in every room. I looked in our backyard and I couldn't see him. And then I started to panic even more and saying, Evan, Evan, where are you? Come on. This is not funny, dude. You have to come out of hiding. But definitely he was not hiding. And, and then eventually uh, the doorbell rings and we see our uh, neighbor holding my son saying, I just found him on the street. You guys are great parents. I remember the feeling of going after my son all over the house and thinking, what do I need to do to find him? Because I had just lost him. That, that is the same feeling that the shepherd has for you as his love chases after you. And you know what else? Is that you, you can't outrun God. 
even though we may walk at a pace that is faster than the pace that allows us to be slow and consistent, you still cannot outrun him. And some of you here have been living a life already that is trying to outrun the goodness of God, his righteousness, his holiness, his plan for your life. And God wants to let you know that you cannot outrun him, that he is pursuing you, and that he wants you to be found in his love. Amen. But we have to learn how to slow our pace. We have to learn that it's okay to slow down in a culture that hurries. I've heard uh, Pastor John Mark Comer quote Eugene Peterson talking about slowing down. And this is what he says, is that sometimes it's important to wait for our souls to catch up with our bodies of being alert and attentive to what God is doing in and for us. And sometimes it is important to slow down and let our souls catch up with what our bodies have been doing. He couldn't have said it better. And as we leave this place, we have to make sure that we are making time for that. And the Lord created us. He's already designed a time for us to slow down and to delight ourselves in Him, which is called the Sabbath. And you may have heard this word, which is the day of rest. The Lord created uh, the world in six days and on the seventh day he rested. And he's given us a day of rest in the same way. And you and I can take part of that because on a day of rest we can let our souls catch up with our bodies. In our day of rest we can slow down and walk at the pace of Jesus. In our day of rest we can enjoy God in the blessings he has given us. One of the things that I love to do the most is to watch my kids play. And in our backyard, they've started doing something that I never knew how to do. Because I grew up in a city of 7 million people. And so all I knew was concrete growing up. But my kids know how to fish, how to uh, find worms and crawdads. And they also love throwing all those things on top of me and making me scream. And even though I don't like the critters, I enjoy seeing my kids playing around me and with me and in front of me. And in the same way, when you're slowing down and you're giving Jesus your rest, he delights in the way you rest in him. And you can also delight in him. Listen to Isaiah chapter 58, verses 13 and 14. If you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath and from doing as you please on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's holy day honorable, and if you honor it by not going your own way, not doing as you please or speaking idle words, then you will find your joy in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride in triumph on the heights of the land, and to feast on the inheritance of your father Jacob, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. There is blessing in creating time for us to enjoy Jesus and let him enjoy us in the Sabbath. And as we delight in him, something happens too. Psalm 37 verse 4. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. See, this is another observation we can make. As we run at slower paces, that at his pace we can make an intentional decision to delight in him and his blessings. And when you delight in him, he does give you the desires of your heart. Because the desires of your heart begin to align with the desires of his heart. Which are better than the desires you've been hatching. His plans are better than our plans. And whatever you think is the ideal situation for your life right now, if it's not aligned with the plans of God, it's not going to be better than the plans of God. It can be good. It can be just okay. But it's not going to be better. And he's got a better plan for you. And you want to discover what that is. And you want to be also intentional. I want to encourage you to, with intentionality, find time to slow down, to make a decision right now. Especially as a 17, 18, 19 year old to make a decision that you will slow down from this point on and make it a priority to spend time with Jesus. There, there's a few ways that we can even say practically as to how to do that. And the first one is you can commit to developing a set of core values. You may say, how do I do this? You can Google it, but really it's about sitting down and saying, these are the, the values that I'm going to have from this point on that will never break. And one of those values is going to reflect, or all those values, they're going to reflect my relationship with Jesus. One of my values is hope. And I want to receive hope from Jesus. And I'm going to make time to receive hope from Jesus so that I can give and share the hope of Jesus with as many people as possible. 
You may even create a rule of life, which is a practice that was started in the Middle Ages. And in essence, is where you make a list of the behaviors that are going to rule your life, where you say, from now on daily, I will spend this time with Jesus. Whether I read my Bible or I pray or I go on a walk, I will, I will weekly spend time with Jesus in the Sabbath. And you develop a rule of life that can uh, dictate the behaviors that become non-negotiable for you. I heard somebody say, if you don't develop the right habits in your 20s, you will be catching up in your 30s and 40s. And y'all, my confession right now, I never did in my 20s. I am catching up. You don't have to. You are at the right season of life to develop this. And lastly, you can commit to actually scheduling your pace into your calendar. Because we all have calendars on our phones and you can make an appointment with Jesus every day, every week, every month, and every year for however long you feel that you should do it. And these are just suggestions and recommendations, but really the idea is to figure out what our plan is to keep up with the pace, to let Jesus um, uh, lead us into a pace that is slow and consistent. The question is, what is your plan to walk at the pace of Jesus? Don't leave here without a plan. You can extend what you've been experiencing here with the Lord by making a plan that you will continue to touch base with Him and make Him the most important relationship of your life because He can be and is and will be. And as you make those decisions, you can include other people. You can make a plan that can lead you to walk with Him in a slow and consistent way so that you can finish the race well. Now, some of you in the next few hours or the next couple days are going to head to your next layover. Whether that is at home where your parents are waiting for you or your guardians. Whether that is at a college in a city that you have never lived in or maybe in a whole other country if your family is moving or maybe the situation won't change much for you but there's still a before and after a mountaintop kind of experience like like this one with Jesus. And so I thought, what better way to finish our time together in prayer than to take on and receive a benediction. A benediction is a set of blessings that are spoken over someone. And there's one particular benediction that was written by St. Patrick, which was a missionary that uh, took the gospel of Jesus to the uh, Irish island and evangelized thousands and thousands of people at the time. And he wrote this benediction for people who would travel. And this is what I want to read to you. And I want to ask you to just stand for the next few minutes as we read this benediction. Stand up for the next few minutes. Close your eyes. Um, extend your arms like this as a symbol of the fact that you want to receive a blessing, not from me, but from the Lord. And as you go on to your next layover, as you go on to enact a slow and steady pace with Jesus, as you go on to live a life that is finding rest and purpose in Him, this is what we can receive from Him. May, they, may the strength of God pilot you. May the power of God preserve you. May the wisdom of God instruct you. May the hand of God protect you. May the way of God direct you. May the shield of God defend you. May the host of God guard you against the snares of evil and the temptations of the world. May Christ be with you. Christ before you. Christ in you. Christ over you. May the Lord's salvation be always yours this day and forevermore. Amen.